Thank you, Robert. What a, what a fine introduction. I've known members of the Friends for 18 years now, the time that I've been here, and they are a fabulous group who give up their time freely. And for me, a historian, what a delight it is to talk to the Friends, most of whom have served in the Canadian Forces, to hear their stories, to gather their wisdom. It is a great honor uh, to be among the Friends of the Canadian War Museum. When the guns fell silent on the Western Front at 11 a.m. on November 11, 1918, the war ended, but the echo of the war's long scream has reverberated to the present. This year, we know, marks the 100th anniversary of the First World War that had such a profound effect on the world and on Canada. And the world, the war's enduring impact is what I will be focusing on tonight, largely on Canada. I think at the heart of the war's legacy is the terrible loss of life. The war led to the deaths of nine million soldiers. Many millions more were killed, civilians, killed by direct attack, by starvation, by genocide. Millions of additional wounded veterans returned home, often to countries shattered by the war, their own bodies broken, their minds tormented. That is a dark legacy. Cet an plus tard, de telles pertes continuées de marquer nos esprits, voire de nous horrifier. The war ushered in monumental geopolitical changes. Four dynastic empires were destroyed. Germany, Austria-Hungary, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. The world was remade in the forge of the war. Out of the ashes of empire came nine new countries that had not existed in 1914. Nine, including Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Poland. With Europe in ruins, new world powers rose, the United States and Japan, and they would be set on a collision course two decades later. In Russia, the war led to conditions where the Pol Bolsheviks took power, destroyed the monarchy, and established communism. And that communism, as we know, is still with us today, despite all of its mutations, variations, and perversions. The aftermath of the war saw the Middle East carved up, leading to an almost century of ethnic, tribal, and national warfare, another powerful and dark legacy from the war. And in the aftermath of the Treaty of Versailles, which formally ended the war, came Hitler, raving about the injustice of the treaty and even claiming that the war had not been lost at the battlefront, but from Jews and socialists stabbing the soldiers in the back. He was wrong, of course, but his twisted ideology, fired by the fury of the war, would firm up into the Nazi ideology and would lead directly to the horror of the Second World War. Au Canada, c'est le pays en que la guerre a changé à tout jamais. Il s'agit de la plus grande et importante réalisation de sa jeune histoire. Sur une population de 8 millions, plus de 630 000 hommes se sont enrôlés ou ont été conscrits sans y verront un homme adulte sur toi. C'est aussi plusieurs milliers de femmes qui ont servi comme infirmières auprès de détachements d'aide volontaire. Our farms produced hundreds of millions of bushels of wheat, and our factories produced tens of millions of shells, to the point where in 1917, a third of all shells fired by the British armies were made in Canada. That was an extraordinary contribution. And during the war, Canada's primary fighting arm, the Canadian Corps, 100,000 strong, and commanded by a Canadian from June of 1917, Sir Arthur Curry, delivered victory after victory at Vimy, at Hill 70, at Passchendaele, and in Canada's greatest victories, the 100 Days, of which we have a new exhibition on right now. 
The Canadian Corps punched above its weight time and time again. And Canada's Prime Minister, Sir Robert Borden, would use Canada's service and sacrifice at home and on the battlefields to demand a voice at the Treaty of Versailles. And such actions allowed Canadians to take control of their foreign policy. Voilà une leg inestimable de la guerre qui était toutefois inconceivable lorsqu'elle duré en 1914. Such actions were impossible even to imagine before the war. But there were dark legacies in Canada as well. Just as the war propelled us to nationhood, it nearly destroyed the country. The exertions of the total war led to deep commitments and an unfettered war effort that demanded almost any sacrifice in the name of victory. The most prominent need was to meet the ongoing requirement of more soldiers. There were some 400,000 who joined the ranks voluntarily, but that number was not enough. Conscription was introduced in the House in May of 1917. The summer of 1917 was a vicious one in Canada. There were riots in the streets. There were protests. Conscription unleashed a powerful sense of rage and unrest among Canadians. It pitted community against community, group against group, English versus French, new Canadians versus those who had been here for many generations. There were attacks on civil liberties. There were shootings in the streets. The exertion of the war was tearing the country apart. It was felt across the country, but especially in French Canada. Women would play a key role in the First World War. They were involved in patriotic movements and in raising tens of millions for soldiers' dependents. La femme qui s'en entre sur le marché du travail en grand nombre ont directement contribué à la effort de guerre sur plusieurs fronts. They served in factories, they served on farms, they served everywhere. Women received the right to vote during the First World War. An incredible legacy still with us today. It would have come at some point, but it was deeply grounded in the First World War. The war led to greater government intervention in the lives of Canadians. Power was centralized in Ottawa like never before. Paying for the war required the selling of war bonds, the introduction of the supposedly temporary income tax. We should say something to someone about that, right? The war also forced Canada into the American orbit to pay for the war. The U.S. charged high interest rates on loans of hundreds of millions, and Canada had to pay. We became entangled in New York's financial networks as the war weakened the financial bonds to London. That's a key legacy, not well known, I think, among many Canadians. Neither is the fact that some 40,000 Americans served in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Americans and Canadians fought together, they died together. Those are important bonds of service that should not be forgotten. New Canadian heroes emerged from the war. John McRae, Billy Bishop, Arthur Curry. There were new artistic movements, ironically, in spaces of tremendous violence and destruction. There was great creation. Four of the future members of the Group of Seven painted during the war. We have many of their works of art here in our Beaverbrook Art Collection, an incredible collection. A.Y. Jackson, one of those who served in uniform and who painted, said, we are no longer humble colonials. We've made armies. We can also make artists, historians, and poets. There was no going back to the old ways. Canada emerged stronger more sure of itself. Then there were the veterans, some 550,000 who returned to Canada. 173,000 of them had suffered wounds during the war, about half of them grievously. The federal government was forced to intrude into the realm of provincial health. It established new medical centers, hospitals, treatment areas, limb factories. This state-sponsored support for veterans had a profound effect on Canada's medical system. 
veterans would become a force in our society. They would contribute to the emergence of the modern Canada over the next several generations, as would their sons and daughters who served in the Second World War. And yet, the dead perhaps exerted a stronger influence on shaping the war's legacy. Canada suffered 66,000 killed. That's from a country of 8 million. We're five times as large today. Today's equivalent in a four-year period would be 330,000 dead. Newfoundland, a separate dominion, lost over 1,600 dead. Imagine the sadness and the sorrow that filtered through the land. So many mothers and fathers who would outlive their sons. So many siblings and grandparents who never had a chance to properly say goodbye. Canada was shattered by those deaths. And so after the war, we responded by building memorials and monuments across our country. I imagine wherever you are from, every city, every town, every village, there is a First World War monument. There are some 4,000 across our country. Il y a des monuments qui revêtent une importance nationale, comme le Tour de la Paix, and the Monument National Commemorative de Guerre du Canada. There are icons of commemoration, the poppy, two minutes of silence, and of course, Remembrance Day. These powerful symbols of remembrance, perhaps none so moving and evocative as the one furthest from Canada, the monument in Vimy Ridge for Canada's fallen, provoke us to contemplate service and sacrifice, heroics and grief, anger at the losses and pride over the accomplishments. The Great War, 100 years on, retains a powerful hold on our imagination. We continue to see its vast and deep legacy across the world and in multiple fields of Canadian life, from politics to grand economics, from culture to commemoration. For many, there is a desire to know and to connect to bear witness to the loss and the pride, and perhaps to remind ourselves that our scarred and shared history continues to infuse the ever-reinvented and complex Canada. Thank you, Messi. From All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remarque. It is autumn. There are not many of the old hands left. I am the last of the seven fellows from our class. Everyone talks of peace and armistice. All wait. If it again proves an illusion, then they will break up. Hope is high. It cannot be taken away again without an upheaval. If there is not peace, there will be revolution. I have 14 days rest because I have swallowed a bit of gas. In the little garden, I sit the whole day long in the sun. The armistice is coming soon. I believe it now, too. Then we will go home. Here my thoughts stop. It will not go any farther. All that meets me, all that floods over me are but feelings. Greed of life, love of home, yearning for blood intoxication of deliverance, but no aims. Had we returned home in 1916, out of the suffering and the strength of our experiences, we might have unleashed a storm. Now, if we go back, we will be weary, broken, burnt out, rootless, and without hope. We will not be able to find our way home. And men will not understand us, for the generation that grew up before us, though it had passed these years with us, already had a home and a calling. Now that generation will return to its old occupations, and the war will be forgotten. And the generation that has grown up after us will be strange to us and push us aside. We will be superfluous even to ourselves. We will grow older. A few will adapt themselves. Some others will merely submit, and most will be bewildered. 
The years will pass by, and in the end, we shall fall into ruin. But perhaps all this that I think is mere melancholy and dismay. Perhaps it will fly away as the dust when I stand once again beneath the poplars and listen to the rustling of their leaves. It cannot be that it is gone, the yearning that made our blood unquiet, the unknown, the perplexing, the oncoming things, the thousand faces of the future, the melodies from dreams and from books, the whispers and divinations of women. It cannot be that this is vanished in bombardment, in despair, in brothels. From the Manchester Guardian. The first stroke of eleven produced a magical effect. The tram cars glided into stillness. Motors ceased to cough and fume and stop dead. And the mighty limbed dray horses hunched back upon their loads and stopped also, seeming to do it of their own volition. Someone took off his hat and with a nervous hesitancy, the rest of the men bowed their heads also. Here and there, an old soldier could be detected slipping unconsciously into the posture of attention. An elderly woman, not far away, wiped her eyes, and the man beside her looked white and stern. Everyone stood very still. The hush deepened. It had spread over the whole city and become so pronounced as to impress one with a sense of audibility. It was a silence which was almost pain. And the spirit of memory brooded over it all.
From the Lost Generation by Ernest Hemingway. It was when we had come back from Canada and were living in the Rue Notre Dame des Champs, and Miss Stein and I were still good friends, that Miss Stein made her remark about the Lost Generation. She had some ignition difficulties with an old Model T Ford that the, she then drove, and the young man who worked in the garage and had served in the last year of the war had not been adept and perhaps had not broken the priorities of other vehicles in repairing Miss Stein's Ford. Anyway, he had not been serieux and had been corrected severely by the patron of the garage after Miss Stein's protest. The patron had said to him, you are all a generation perdu. That's what you are, that's what you all are, Miss Stein said. All of you young people who served in the war, you are a lost generation. But the hell with her lost generation talk and all the dirty, easy labels. I said to my wife, you know, Gertrude is nice, but she does talk a lot of rot sometimes.
They used to tell me I was building a dream, and so I followed the mob. When there was earth to plow or guns to bear, I was always there, right on the job. They used to tell me I was building a dream with peace and glory ahead. Why should I be standing in line, just waiting for bread?
Thank you.